Today, viewers, we're in Luxor, where the ancient city of Thebes was based. We're going to be exploring the Karnak Temple Complex and Luxor Temple, some of Egypt's most important historical sites. On the west bank of the Nile is the Valley of the Kings, where many pharaohs are buried. The idea is that the sun sets in the west, and hence the dead are symbolically laid to rest there. Meanwhile, here on the eastern bank of the Nile, you'll find places of worship like Karnak, because the sun rises in the east, and hence it's associated with life, rebirth, and the gods. Karnak's construction began in 1550 BC, nearly three and a half thousand years ago. I'm gonna show you today how each of these monuments carries its own unique stories. I'll explain as we walk along, the Hyksos, or Hyksos rather, were a group um, who took control of the northern part of Egypt and the Nile Delta. Um, and the guys from Thebes here eventually overthrew them. Uh, and in doing so, they reunified Egypt. That is where we sort of consider the New Kingdom to have begun. Um, and the guys who ran that New Kingdom at the start were the 18th dynasty, who are basically essentially a, a specific you know, bloodline. Um, and it's really in this 18th dynasty that Egypt was at its most powerful and its most wealthy. And it's in this period that um, Karnak was constructed. Karnak was built over the period of about a thousand years. Um, and about 30 pharaohs contributed to its construction, each one trying to outdo the previous with greater halls and greater temples. Um, and so over this time, it became absolutely central to Egyptian religious, religion. And of course, the complexity and the sheer scale of it grew and grew. So I'm walking around the Great Hypostyle Hall, the precinct of Amun-Re, and it's one of the most magnificent features of the Karnak. It's comprised of 134 columns arranged in 16 rows. Uh, 122 of these are 10 meters tall, and the remaining um, 12 are over 21 meters tall. Um, and you can see that over here, the much larger ones, and then behind um, we have the shorter ones. And if I look above, you'll see these architraves, these long rocks going over the top. And it's thought that these architraves um, weigh up to 70 tons. And originally, you wouldn't have been able to see the sky in here like you can today, it would have been closed. And I think that would have given it a really kind of gloomy and but very powerful uh, impression as you walk around here, presumably just with the light of the fire, these, these um, you know, carvings were painted and so they would have lit up as you wandered around. And, you know, you can almost even today get lost in this maze of 134 columns. And they're all designed to look like papyrus, um, this being the buds at the top of papyrus. And there's some debate as to how the architraves, those 70 ton slabs at the top, um, got lifted up there. Some people think it was with levers, but that would have been a time consuming and difficult process, especially balancing them. Um, so another theory is that they were actually built using ramps. They would sort of build a ramp out of mud, brick and stone, and then sort of drag them up to the top. Um, and they, you know, they reckon they would have maybe used some kind of railway um, to kind of get them up to the top um, as well. And then finally, once up, um, they would have then done the carving on them uh, so that the carvings you know, weren't damaged um, you know, as they were being put into place, positioned. So you may be wondering, who was this temple dedicated to? And it was dedicated to a moon, who was the local tutelary deity um, of Thebes. And I'm just looking at him here. You can see him quite clearly there. And he's recognizable by his ostrich plume feathers in his hat, the tall, long feathers uh, you can see on his hat here. A moon rose from being a local uh, Theban god to Egypt's state deity. So you remember we spoke about how the Hyksos were overthrown by Thebes. Well, when that happened, Thebes became the capital of Egypt. And so their local god became a much more universally worshipped one. He became the main god uh, of Egypt. 
And you'll notice that some of these later depictions of him, he's an itty phallic man, which is a fancy way of saying he's got an erection, a pocket rocket. It's interesting because we've noticed that on a lot of the statues, oh sorry, car uh, stone carvings, uh, he's actually had his penis like scratched off. Yeah, you can see this one's a great example. They've actually scratched it out. It's offended someone's sensibilities, hasn't it? A moon is literally everywhere. I mean, if you look at this view, for example, you can see he's there, he's on the next column, he's on the next column. And here he's um, appearing alongside his wife, Moot. She's associated with the primordial waters of new, of which kind of the whole world was born and kind of the mother of everything in the world. Um, and also her son was Konsu, the uh, god with the uh, bird head. And Konsu is the son of uh, a moon, but also the god of a moon, as in a moon in the sky. <laughs> it's a bit of a tricky sentence to, to say. So Amy just spotted something really cool, which is Thoth. Um, and that is the uh, god with the body of a man and the head uh, of an ibis. And Thoth is really quite interesting because he's the god of hieroglyphics, um, but also the god of uh, writing and um, also wisdom. Uh, and along with Konsu, who we just saw uh, around the corner uh, a second ago, he's also responsible for the passage of time. But also, you know, in Australia, Ibises are called bin chickens because the ibises always hang around the bins. I think these bloody Aussies need to show some respect, if I'm honest. <laughs> and here's a lovely little additional feature. Um, you see up here these lattice um, windows. Now, you'll recall earlier I mentioned that there would have been uh, a roof here. Well, that's the light that would have come in. The light would have come in from this lattice window, um, as well as presumably some torches as well. Um, so that would give you a sense of the amount of light that would have been in here, not a great deal. Um, again, again, though, I think that that's a design element um, purposefully to uh, enhance the aura uh, of this place. So we're going to walk now uh, towards kind of the center of the temple um, and all of these passageways sort of funnel you to a central point and when the 18th dynasty um, as I mentioned expelled Hyksos um, they attributed their success to a moon um, and so at the center of the temple down here we'll find um, this uh, sort of the central point where they would worship uh, a moon so we'll walk down there now and this was very special. This is where the high priest would make offerings to a little statue of the god of a moon. So yeah, they would place a little statue uh, of a moon here, uh, right on top of here, and he would get a little bit treated like a person. They would give him daily meals, they would wash him, clothe him, uh, anoint him in perfume. They would burn incense here. They would even entertain him with dances and music. Um, and then, and, and if you know he was satisfied, etc. In return, he would make the sun rise. He would make the Nile flood, and he would maintain the empire of Egypt. It's interesting because there aren't any tourists here, but. Uh, in many respects, this is kind of the most important part of the entire temple. This is where they would focus their worship towards a moon. And here you can see just endless depictions of him. Each one of these with that classic ostrich plume feathers hat that he would wear. Incredible. And then above here, look as well, you can see the roof would have been adorned with stars so he would have been looking up at the night sky. Because he was the god of fertility, you can see the itiphalic representation of him there and there. Uh, and you can see this is the actual um, procession that would have carried him. So you can see here this boat, a moon would have been placed within this and then would have been carried um, as they sort of took him uh, in ritual ceremonies. For example, one of those is they would take him up onto the roof so that he could uh, receive sunlight. But, and then here are the offerings. 
So this is the depiction of what would have been offered to him and he would have received the finest uh, offerings. They would have burnt the finest incense, they would have offered him uh, the finest meats. Um, again, they would have you know, placed those you know, at that altar around the corner um, you know, that we saw in here to a moon. Now we're just heading towards the sacred lake and according to Egyptian creation myth, before creation the world was filled with darkness uh, and water and when we were in the um, Hippostyle Hall there you saw the giant columns, they're meant to be papyrus and a, min, uh, a moon rather, um, was meant to be born in a primeval papyrus swamp and I think it's interesting that um, over at this sacred lake that's meant to sort of represent um, you know, be symbolic of essentially their creation story, if you will, um, how accurate it was. You know, we know now about human evolution that we you know, did evolve from, you know, they sort of newt-like creatures that we see <laughs> from the science. Um, but yeah, the lake is meant to be symbolic of that birth of humanity from the water. So behind me, we've got the lake. And I think it's not surprising that they sort of look, of wa look at water as the giver of life when you consider, you know, the kind of the importance um, of the Nile, the role that it played, you know, in supporting the entire agricultural system. When you sort of, you know, travel further away from the Nile and you see the sort of arid desert environment, the importance of water. So in a way, it's not really surprising that, th that they look at this, um, at the lake as sort of symbolic um, of the you know, evolution of life for them. So all this wealth and money pouring into the construction um, you know, of these monuments and also pouring into the kind of uh, daily worship of gods like a moon, by proxy that made the priests very wealthy. So wealthy in fact that they began to actually rival the pharaohs in terms of their power. So it was here that the uh, male and female priests would bathe themselves um, twice a day. They'd wash themselves in the evening uh, and in the morning. And the idea was that they would clean themselves, maintain their purity because of their close contact with the gods. And so they were called the pure ones. And as an extension of this, they would also shave their bodies. They would remove all the hair from their uh, arms, from their heads. Um, and they would also wear pure white robes. Um, and as well, because they were speaking to the gods, they would use natron salt to actually clean their teeth. So they actually had very good dental hygiene. It's just been doing bloody laps around this place. <laughs> We've just gone all the way around trying to find the priests for you. But here they are. I'm quite excited about this because they're quite different to um, the uh, other depictions of gods that you see. But look here. Here we have Amenhotep. And Amenhotep, the high priest, and then I think he's with Ramses, Ramses the Ninth. Um, and it's interesting because I'm going to tell you about a power struggle that took place a little bit earlier than this between what was called Akhenaten um, and the priests of the time. And power eventually returned to the priests. Bit of a spoiler alert there. But it's interesting to see here the priests. You can see with the bald head because they've shaved, he shaved his head. Um, the symbol of purity and look at um, how he's situated on the wall. He's the same height um, as Ramesses here and, and, and that's as if to say we are of the same uh, importance, we are of the same power, um, hence why they're almost at eye level. And even more interesting as well is they've put um, Ramesses here on a, on a little bit of a pedestal a small pedestal at the front here. And I think that's just fantastic because I, I think this is almost like saying, uh, you know, it, it's symbolic, isn't it? It's the only reason he's taller is because he's on this little pedestal. It's almost, I think, a little bit like a piss take. You know, old great Ram Ramesses sat, stood on his box. But yeah, isn't that awesome? And the, the, all along here, we continue to see um, the priests. And then here as well, we have more priests, again, with the, with the bald head. So I think you guys already watching this um, will be able yourselves to kind of pick out um, features of these uh, stone carvings and figure out who's, who's, uh, who's who. It's actually quite good fun to be honest, to put, point out the gods and see what they're doing and where they are. But yeah, I knew they'd be around here because obviously the lake is here where they bathe, so they were, they were bound to be around here somewhere, and there they all are. 
So this is quite an interesting detail behind me. You can see uh, chariots uh, and the bows here. Now, you remember we talked about how the Hyksos um, were defeated by Thebes. Well, originally the Hyksos, one of the reasons they were so successful was because the, the uh, Hyksos brought the composite bow, which is a bow made of several different parts. It combines both wood and bone. Um, whereas previously bows were just made of wood. Uh, and so ultimately the Egyptians themselves took this bow as well, uh, the composite bow, copied the technology, and this modern technology of war, along with the chariots you can see here, um, helped them defeat uh, the Hyksos. You can see around me right now, all the broken pieces. And you can only imagine what kind of a jigsaw puzzle this must be for the archaeologists putting it all back together. It's just endless giant pieces of stone and also they must all weigh hundreds of kilograms. Like, how do you even, it's like a jigsaw except you can't pick up any of the pieces to look at them. <laughs> yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Thank you, sir. And this goes all the way to Luxor Temple, yeah? Yes, Thank you, sir. I'll show you something else, another little detail of how to tell the distinction between the crown, which is interesting, the two sides of um, Egypt, throughout Egypt's history. There are a number of times where it was divided north and south, um, and there is a crown which depicts the south and a crown which depicts the north. And at times when the pharaoh was the king of both the north and the south, he has the combined hat. So here, this is one of the crowns. And then here, this is the other crown. And then here, up there, is the combined crown. And you can see it's quite literally a combination uh, of the two. Wow, I'm really starting to get my history buzz on now. So look at this on here. And this is, of course, you can just see the top of it's a moon. But unlike the other images of a moon, you can actually see the individual feathers on his plume, uh, the ostrich feather. Uh, so now do you see with this here, the actual, you know, how it actually looked like feathers uh, on the back of an ostrich. Amy, do you see that? And here as well. Very, very cool. And this one actually still holds a lot of the colour. You can see the blue pots, the red the knees over there. Awesome stuff. I'll tell you what, ladies and gents, I'm going to be an itty phallic man in a minute when I when I come around this corner and see this view. It's going to be absolutely awesome. <laughs> I'm going to look just like a moon in one of those pictures. <laughs> Too much, Amy? Yeah, maybe I won't put that in. But no, the reason I'm saying it is we're going to get a view down the Valley of the Sphinx. So we're walking now from Karnak down the Valley of the Sphinx to the Temple of Luxor. So this, ladies and gents, is Sphinx Avenue. I think it's two kilometers or 2.7 kilometers long um, and it's got over a thousand I think it's a thousand I find it specifically I wrote it down 1057 uh, statues in the form of sphinxes uh, along it presumably every single one of these would have had a sphinx on it at one point or another and there are three main iterations uh, of the sphinx this is the, the Sphinx with the body of a lion and the head of a man. But we've seen a lot already of the Ram Sphinxes, which is the head of the Ram and the body of a lion. And of course, that is associated with the moon, that Ram. You know, it's that association with being warlike and also that association with fertility uh, as well. I might have to double check this for you as well, but I'm pretty sure that this avenue used to be a canal. Um, and that they would float down here, uh, one of those boats uh, with the statue of a moon uh, on top of it when they sort of did the processions. And then later they paved it over uh, and then would carry him, um, you know, down this avenue. So 
So we've just walked down the Valley of Sphinxes, um, but I wanted to come to the Luxor Museum before we go to um, Luxor Temple to tell you about one of the most important stories uh, of the New Kingdom of Egypt, the story of Akhenaten. Composite bow. So you remember earlier I talked about the importance of the composite bow uh, when Hyksos, Hyksos, Hyksos um, took over the northern part of Egypt and how eventually the Egyptians ended up using their own new technology of war <clears throat> against the Hyksos. They used their own tech against them. Well, here it is. The arrows were made of reeds. Wow. And you see, you see what I mean about that quite distinctive shape that we, stood in the, we saw in the stone carvings? Awesome. I wasn't expecting to see that. Really cool. This here is the larger bow before the composite bow. You can see how much larger and hence more difficult it was to maneuver. Amy, I've bloody seen him, I've bloody seen him. Akhenaten, that's Akhenaten. Akhenaten's over here. And the Teletet stones. And Akhenaten was very aware of that growing power and wealth that those priests we discussed earlier uh, were starting to get. And so what he did was, he was starting this monotheistic religion. Uh, monotheistic religions are religions that believe in one God. He aimed to dismantle Egypt's religion as it was known at the time, the multi-god religion, a religion that was so ingrained in part of the culture. Uh, and in doing so, he would also remove power uh, from those pesky priests. He decided to build a new temple uh, at Karnak out of smaller bricks, not this giant, you know, 70 ton monolith that we saw this morning, like, you know, in the Hyperstar Hall, for example. Um, the idea being that with these smaller bricks, he could put up the temple way faster. And that suited him perfectly because he wanted these temples up and he wanted these temples dedicated to the one God. And that one God for him, he decided was Aten, the sun god. And, and that was kind of, this was, this was unthinkable. Akhenaten had not only built a temple to one god, but that one god wasn't a moon. That one god was Aten, the sun god. So you can imagine the priest's reaction to this. Um, you know, wealthy families who, who for generations had, um, you know, worshipped a whole multitude of gods, um, you know, were, were, were horrified. And, um, as you can imagine, the priests were incandescent. Here we have um, some of the some of the stones from uh, these temple from this temple, and it's really significant as well because it's the first where well, they believe it's the first monotheistic religion of all time. It's the first time in human history that a religion has begun to grow that focuses on one God. So you may be beginning to see why Akhenaten here. Uh, was known as the heretic pharaoh. Um, you know, all this was not cool with the priests. And so um, they went as far, um, Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti, of actually closing down Karnak, getting rid of all the, uh, all the um, priests, and then taking all of the wealth from the treasury. And of all these stones that we have, there are little clues. But the best one, of course, is this down here, that someone has fantastically put them, um, you know, puzzled together these pieces and you can see the worshippers are flat um, are flat on their on their stomachs they're in the dirt uh, they're not worshipping on their knees as you see in other uh, stone carvings um, across Egypt no these guys are flat on their stomachs in the dirt um, worshipping um, Akhenaten. Akhenaten it just shows you how aggressive this was and I feel like bloody Indiana Jones here looking for like the tiniest little, little detail in a single stone to find a clue to, to a puzzle. <laughs> so here are the hands. And you see, these hands aren't coming down um, onto a god. Uh, they're coming down onto Akhenaten, I believe, and also Nefertiti. You'll notice up there, again, the, the rays of sunshine coming down onto Akhenaten. And, that's, and that, what that's saying is, the only way to access me Aten, sun god, is through the worship of the pharaoh. So he's taking people's worship and almost turning it into, he's, he's, he's almost turning himself into a sort of a catalyst of the religion itself, which is awesomely interesting. And, and what's also interesting is, is that um, Aten, you're not allowed to, he, he's, um, 
he's sort of an abstract god. You're not allowed to portray him uh, in any way. Um, so you won't see any statues or any carvings of Arten. You'll, you'll find these kinds of things instead. So it's interesting that he created this monotheistic religion, this one god religion, but then he placed himself right at the center of it. And I think what's even more exciting, and I, something I wasn't expecting to see, is that if you look here, where are the monks? Oh, sorry, where are the priests? The priests are lower than him. So he's changing the status quo. He's saying, come to me for your worship of God. Come through me. And on top of that, look at where I'm standing. Look at the way that the priests are standing in relation to me. I am the powerful one. I am above the priests. In a way, he's saying, I am our, you know, God, God on earth. Incredible. This is my favorite favorite stone of them all. I just think the little hands coming down from the sky, from the sun rather. Yeah. They're such intricate little fingers and hands. It's just such, an it's such a beautiful idea really in all this madness that the blessings are coming down from the sun in the hands upon you. So it's kind of a really nice idea, isn't it? You can see that. You can recognize it easily. And Amy's just absolutely nailed it as well. And in this as well, sorry, I'm really buzzing. <laughs> in this as well, all the priests are bringing him things. He's created this religion. Priests are absolutely beside themselves. And then he goes and puts up this temple really quickly. And in that temple, he doesn't do it to their god, the, the main god, Amun. And then on top of that, he's got all bloody pictures of them serving him, bringing this bloody art in God, all these bloody things, all these offerings. So you can imagine... Um, what, how, what the priest made of all this. And it, it really looks like he didn't hold back. The priest would have been absolutely indignant. They're all just working away, endlessly bringing things, uh, offerings, and you can see some of the sorts of things he's got here, you know, the, all the finest. This is beer, actually, I'm pretty sure. So that uh, Artin can, can get pissed. <laughs> Amy was saying that this whole scene Am I pointing at the right thing here? Yes, that, that whole scene there might actually be him making the beer itself. So after he sacked these priests, um, and after he uh, raided their you know, wealth and, and took, raided the treasuries and took all the money, etc., whatever, took all the wealth, um, he went and built Amarna. And he did this and as a kind of a new center of religion, a new capital where he would stay. In fact, he was so stubborn about this, um, at times he wouldn't even leave Amarna. And so it was actually difficult to actually manage state affairs. You know, the head of the state would never leave the bloody Amarna. And he put Amarna up really quickly, and he put Amarna up. Um, 400 kilometers north, uh, really kind of in the middle of the desert on the Nile. It was, there was nothing there. They think that maybe he put it there because the Nile shape at that location um, looks like the hieroglyphic symbol for the horizon. And of course the sun sets on the horizon. And so there was a link there to Artin, Artin being the sun god. Um, and he poured enormous wealth into this um, process and you know, nearly bloody bankrupt the, the whole country. And here we have another image of him, and I just think it's really interesting the slim, slim uh, face they give him. They almost give him a sort of an evil kind of look. Like, and I've noticed that they say this here as well, in contrast to idealized images of earlier kings. He's almost like, I just find it such an incredible story. He's almost like going, I'm here, I'm the bad guy, and you're worshiping me, boys. This is it now. <laughs> you priests are out of here. And not only that, I'm closing down your Karnak temple, and I'm gonna start my own city and my own religious center called Amarna, and you guys are just gonna like it. <laughs> Gonna, you're just going to get on board and that's it so yeah it's absolutely fantastic he also he looks a little bit like you know Scar from Disney or something like he has a slightly evil malevolent look to him doesn't he it says here he's holding the Heka and, and Wast the symbol of judgment well he just would be wouldn't he <laughs> he wouldn't be holding a bunch of bloody daisies would he <laughs> I think as well, as much as Akhenaten is, uh, you know, portrayed um, in the historical records as a bit of a rebel, and I think certainly by the looks of these people lying on their stomach, he was that. He might not have been the best guy. I think it's also f fair to say that Akhenaten also was a bit, may have been a bit of a visionary. 
um, you know, to kind of create a monotheistic religion, to be the first person to do that. When you consider nowadays that most major religions across the globe are all monotheistic religions, except for, you know, perhaps like Hinduism, um, they, but they certainly dominate. Um, it's interesting that he was the first person to come up with that. And it's also interesting that the way that Akhenaten actually used religion to control people, um, I think is very interesting. Um, so as evil as it was, um, it says a lot and it, it, about the, can we say genius of the guy? I don't know, but it's interesting that he used it you know, in this manner, uh, you know, three and a half thousand years ago. So these little figurines were placed in tombs and essentially they're servants um, and minions for the deceased. The idea being that if you needed to get some work done, you had some servants around you and uh, you could call upon them for a bit of manual labor in the afterlife. Now I'm gonna pop over to Luxor Temple and explain what happened to this story. Akhenaten, I can tell you, passed away and Tutankhamun uh, sort of did his level best to restore the status quo to get things back to normal. And when Akhenaten died, his son Tutankhamun uh, took over. He was nine years old. And Tutankhamun changed his name to Tutankhamun. Our moon, of course, being the god of Thebes, the god of Karnak. Uh, and so you can see he was trying to re-establish favor with the wealthy and with the priests by changing his name to Amun, probably under the guidance of his advisors, um, given how old he was. And Tutankhamun moved back to Thebes, um, where he'd been born, and the priests at Thebes eventually tore down uh, Akhenaten's temples to sort of erase him from history. At Luxor Temple here, Tutankhamun completed uh, the decoration of the entrance of the colonnade of Amenhotep, Amenhotep III. And Tutankhamun also made several endowments to the priests and cults dedicated to Amun. He also commissioned new statues and new monuments made from the best metals and the finest stones. He reinstated uh, all those priests um, who worshipped the, you know, the cult of uh, Amun. Um, and at the same time, he re-established Karnak and Thebes as really the um, religious center of ancient Egyptian at the time. So he's really sort of going um, hell to leather to try to reinstate Amun and trying to demonstrate that, you know, he's on side with the priests and with the wealthy. He was really trying to reverse those policies of his father. Here you can see they're literally lifting one of the heads on with a crane back onto the sculpture. Uh, an example of archaeology in practice or restoration in practice. You can see this head swinging around there on the crane. So during Akhenaten's uh, reign, uh, diplomatic relations have been neglected and there's evidence from Tutankhamun's tomb, from various gifts he received from other countries, that he made efforts to um, restore these. But unfortunately, there were battles with the Nubians and also the Asiatics, so he wasn't entirely successful. His tomb contained body armor and a, essentially a military stool, um, as well as bows. Uh, Tutankhamun was trained for archery. Um, but it's thought that he may not have actually participated in these battles uh, because he had certain health issues. For example, they think that he may have had some issue walking because they found a number of canes in his tomb. But by the same token, uh, canes are associated with wealth, and so having a collection of canes might not indicate that. But nonetheless, due, due to his age at least, we can say that it's likely that he wasn't actually involved in those battles himself. So Tutankhamun died at age 19, he died young, and he didn't have an heir at the time, and so Seti took over. And Tutankhamun's efforts notwithstanding, Seti really sort of restored things to normality. The monotheistic religion was gone, they went back to, you know, worshipping their multitude of gods, um, and so the Amarna period was over, um, and they had returned to really great times of wealth and plenty. And then, 
Ramses II. And Ramses II was arguably uh, one of Egypt's most prolific constructors. He may have built more than any other uh, pharaoh. And this is no more evident than at Abu Simbel. So I told the story of Akhenaten there, um, and now I'm back at uh, Karnak Temple. And I wanted to talk about some of the other stories because this place was built by so many pharaohs that there are so many individual stories. So I'm here underneath the Hatshepsut uh, obelisk, and Hatshepsut was the longest reigning female pharaoh. Uh, she was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th uh, dynasty. So she ruled from about 1478 uh, until 1458 uh, BC. And she was a prolific um, builder or constructor. She was responsible for a lot of monuments uh, here at Karnak. And I think perhaps one of the greatest of these um, is this obelisk. But she was also responsible for essentially rebuilding the uh, Temple of Mut, uh, which was uh, ravaged by the Hyksos when they were uh, in charge. She erected two obelisks and uh, they were the two tallest in the world. Uh, one of them fell down but this one still stands and in fact this obelisk around here um, is actually the second tallest ancient obelisk still standing on earth. Now it's interesting because um, there was an attempt made to actually remove her from the historiography of Egypt. Her statues were brought down, her uh, constructions and monuments were defaced, um, and many of her achievements were actually attributed to other pharaohs. So there was an attempt to almost get rid of her and remove her from the historical record. Um, and that's quite sad because modern Egyptologists think that that may have been because of sibling rivalry, um, you know, political expediency, or actually just because she was a lady. But the overall point I'm trying to make is that there are so many individual stories from this place. So many pharaohs were involved in constructing it. And so, yes, I've told the story of Tutankhamun and Akhenaten, um, but there are individual stories, like the one about Hakshutset. Um, and, you know, we've not even delved into modern history. There were two other obelisks built by Ramesses II, um, and these were uh, found, these were seen by Napoleon when he was over here. Um, and it was suggested by Napoleon they should bring them back to Paris, but then later uh, this never transpired. Uh, ultimately, though, the Ottoman Empire gifted one to, to the French uh, much later on, um, and the French accepted, and the Ottomans, it's thought, kind of did this as a bit of a fingers up to the UK. But that's why there's now you know, a similar obelisk to the one behind me, um, right in the centre of Paris. And then, of course, there's Alexander the Great, who, of course, was a pharaoh himself, and he's actually depicted here as well. And so there are so many of these individual stories and parts, important parts of history. That it's almost impossible for me to cover it all, and that's why I sort of struggled a little bit with this video compared to others. Um, it's a dense chocolate cake of history, so dense, in fact, you drown in it. But it's also what makes this place so wonderful. You could you know, spend a lifetime studying about, as Egyptologists often do, studying these areas and studying these monuments and continue to learn new things and uncover new individual stories. It's a fascinating, awesome historical site. Well, that's it now, ladies and gents. I hope you enjoyed that. But yeah, I mean, look, it's been a really tricky one, this. and. Tomorrow we're doing the Valley of the Kings, and I know even less about that. You, you have to excuse me a little bit, like I've just walked across Jordan, you know, for six weeks, and uh, I'm already pretty exhausted, and I'm not an Egyptologist. You know, I've just done a lot of reading and research. But I, look, I tried to give you guys just a flavor for it, and I've definitely picked up some of the most important stories, uh, but I hope I have not offended anyone if I've missed critical information about um, Karnak Temple. I'm sure I have. And what a fitting place to end. This wasn't even planned. See how things come together sometimes? Here we have the Valley of the Sphinxes going all the way down there to Luxor Temple. So thanks for joining us and see you on the next video, hopefully. Bye. Look at that. Is it focusing? The thing is, it's night and I'm absolutely sweating. It's 9pm at I'm night. I'm sweating like a pig. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha